The following content has been provided by RWTH Aachen University. Good morning and uh, welcome everybody to uh, current topics in HCI this morning. We uh, will continue our discussion of research approaches to HCI today. So um, just as a quick reminder, we talked about three different approaches uh, in principle and uh, we spent quite some time looking at the first one, the empirical science approach um, that was all about testing um, something uh, of a hypothesis that you had in advance. So today we're going to take a look at the other two approaches that for our discipline, um, coming from a computer science HCI background, I'll be honest, um, it's less frequent that we do this because we are not as trained in this and our skills and expertise lie in other methods and, and uh, domains of HCI. Uh, but they're equally valuable and we've often worked together with others who are really good at doing these kinds of um, research approaches um, to get to results that we couldn't find by ourselves. So the two that we're going to take a look at today um, are um, ethnography and um, the engineering and design approach. Now the engineering and design approach obviously is one that will be very close to our own skill set, but the ethnography one um, is maybe a little weird to somebody who's from a you know purely technical training background so let's look at what what ethnography as a as a scientific method means um, now when you think ethnographer you're probably imagining you know that that researcher jumping around and observing some tribe of natives or some you know animals or some part of nature or something like this but this is not quite what we're thinking about here um, Ethnography is best explained by comparing its approach to what we do in our experimental research that we've talked about so far. So experimental, as you know by now, um, you've got a hunch, you develop it into a research question, you develop it further into a hypothesis that you can test, and then you run a study um, to confirm or reject your hypothesis. That's the you know, very basic approach. Um, in order to do that study, you often have to build some kind of research prototype. Um, but I really like this way that somebody said um, a, a prototype in, for, for researchers is always a question. Right? You build a prototype, not for the prototype's sake, but you build it because you want to ask a question and want to have it answered. So that's your experimental approach. You run your study with your prototype, or maybe you don't have to build something because you're studying something that already exists. It's perfectly fine. You can compare, you know, text input of um, two different existing keyboards and you don't have to build anything yourself. Just a little bit of experimental setup, you know, configuring uh, things to capture typing speed and such. Once you've run your study, you've got a bunch of data, which you then analyze. And um, this then basically lets you confirm or reject your hypothesis and um, build your theory from those results. And usually, kind of like with the DIA cycle, remember from last week we talked about this, once you have a result at this level of understanding, what it usually means is that you now have new questions, right? So you go back and say, okay, I've now learned what happens in this case, but I haven't really understood why that is the case. So let me fiddle with some other variables or create some other conditions in my experiments and see if I can drill deeper. A great example for this is for decades we had, um, you could call it, you know, a theory war going on between people who thought that reading on screen was inherently slower and worse than reading something printed on paper and people who said, no, there is no difference. Um, and, you know, this started in the, the 80s when reading large documents on screens became sort of commonplace, uh, went through the 90s with web browsers beginning to pop up uh, and continued on. And um, each time this question was asked, um, it wasn't that somebody once and for all could say this is, this is the truth, but they were able to understand the whole problem space a little better. Maybe somebody were, was able to run a study that instead of just putting, you know, a typical computer screen next to a piece of paper, was actually able to use a very high resolution computer screen and say, well, if, you know, the resolution gets very high here so that it's visually indistinguishable from a laser printer, um, then, you know, this may 
point out whether the resolution of the computer screen is the reason for potential reading speed differences or whether there's something else going on, you know, the immateriality of the writing, those kinds of things. So experimental research, um, typical in psychology, typical in a lot of chi level HCI research, and often also something that we do in order to evaluate um, um, the, the artifacts that we've built by running such a study. Ethnography works differently. Um, ethnography starts by um, immersing them itself in a situation, um, making no upfront assumptions, um, having no upfront hypothesis, other than that they think this could be an area where something interesting might be going on. Um, it even starts without defining what kind of variables uh, an ethnographer is observing. So you don't say, I'm going to, you know, measure the speed of typing um, of somebody sitting there. I'm just going to watch and see if I notice anything out of the ordinary. So the study leads to data and that data then leads directly to a theory that is based on um, on the data collected and the patterns found in the data. And again, of course, once you've collected your theory, uh, your data and, and built up a theory, you want to then refine it, improve it, strengthen it, um, possibly reject it or change it by going back to the drawing board and running more studies around it. So you have a different starting point, um, which is that you really launch with the study. Um, so of course, you still have a hunch in the beginning that says, hmm, I think there might be something interesting going on um, when, you know, people are using computer-based uh, training um, videos to learn a certain skill. I think there's something happening there that is interesting. But then you go and you study the practice out there um, and you make your observations or you could run interviews. Um, there are a bunch of different ways of collecting that data. And then uh, when you have that data, you do what's called coding. Now, don't get too excited. This is not computer science coding, right? You're not writing um, Python scripts, uh, although you might actually in order to analyze your data. But what coding the data in this case means is that you actually um, try to find patterns in what you've observed or what you've collected, uh, whether it's interview data, responses from interviewees, or, or your videos that you've, cap that you've captured. Um, and then you move from that to try to create theories that explain that data, you know, explain those patterns that you've observed. And in order to, you know, how do you make sure that this is so something that is of value? Well, you kind of try to poke holes into it, right? So you are usually your own uh, worst enemy in this case, because you then try to attack your theory um, by gathering more data and by trying to see whether your theory holds up or whether it actually sort of collapses in the, in, you know, in the face of having collected more data. And this ultimately leads to a stronger theory. Now you might say, why am I not just collecting all that data in the beginning? Well, because your theory may have led to something that you observed. Um, you know, if we take the example of computer-based instruction, um, you may have noticed something about people glancing between the screen and the thing that they're working on um, and you think that this is something that is uh, you know that is that that is creating some curious effect so then you can focus on that and try to gather more data about that particular part of the interaction so you're gathering more data means that you're going to gather a different kind of data different protocols for that and this in the end strengthens your your theory so it's a lot about data collection uh, how do you do that we already mentioned observation, um, watching people. Typically, you do that um, in their, if you want, you know, natural work environment or habitat or at home where they're using the technology that, that you're interested in. Usually in HCI, it's about some kind of interaction with technology, obviously. Um, but you can also interview people. Um, uh, you could even do some um, participation. So you could immerse yourself so far that you yourself make yourself you know, a person that experiences this. Um, and uh, of course you do a lot of logging. So whenever you, you know, let's say you videotape something, 
you capture a video of some interaction. Um, it's always really helpful to also make some, you know, handwritten notes on the side uh, so that you have sort of a high level index into your video. Because believe me, one of the scariest things uh, when you write your thesis is that you've collected, you know, 18 gigabytes of video material and you have no idea what's where. So while this video is being collected or audio recordings or you know, even if we are collecting event logs uh, from some instrumented software that you wrote, um, always make sure that you have a, a parallel sort of high level log file that you write down what happened and what you think are interesting points to go back to in the video. This can often be your first level of scaffolding for structuring and coding the data um, later on. So you got your field notes, hopefully. Hopefully you've got video, you've got audio, you may have log files. Uh, this is, especially for us in computer science, um, a very uh, elegant way of collecting data. Um, if you are able to, you know, uh, write some application software that you want people to try out and you instrument that software so that it collects log files of every user event that the user does, um, then this is a really convenient way to capture objective measured data. So rather than you having to decide, well, did the user click on that target or did he miss it? You can just, you know, collect that from software and, and log it. But again, it's kind of like with the video. Um, I think Anke can uh, uh, speak to that. She's uh, done some kind of work like this herself. When you've collected a lot of event data, what you usually discover is that you collected way too much data, but that you still missed that one particular kind of data that you actually wanted to capture, you know, that one kind of event. Uh, that's happened to us more than once in the lab that we have to eventually then go back maybe and really rerun the study just because we didn't capture one critical part of the, um, of the data. Now, why all these different methods? Because, and I think I mentioned this word before, uh, but it's, it's really an important approach and a really important technique to get reliable results and results that you can trust and so that you can publish them confident that they are actually um, something other people can rely on uh, is triangulation. Triangulation, we know this from, you know, geometry, right? To triangulate a point by measuring the distance from different areas, you know, those kinds of things uh, from different reference points. Uh, and then you triangulate a signal, you find out where it is in a, in a space, for example. Uh, it's similar here. So triangulation here means that you use multiple data sources, you know, observation and interviews and maybe logging events uh, as a third one, um, so that you look at your problem from different points of view. Um, so different types of data is the most frequent way of doing triangulation. But of course, also, that should be clear after having done the whole empirical science thing here last week, um, obviously from different participants, right? So that's a different participants is almost so self-evident that you don't study just one person um, that I don't actually consider it a real you know, triangulation. It just means you want to have more data um, to you know, bolster your statistics and to make sure that they're more robust. But this different uh, input format, these different data sources are really um, helping you to come to a theory, to a conclusion that is more reliable, right? That you can rely on. Let's look at an example because this is kind of away from what we usually do, right? In computer science. Um, I've spent a couple of research semesters in uh, San Diego at uh, the University of California of San Diego. First of all, great weather, uh, great surfing, but also some of the brightest minds in HCI down there. So uh, it just so happens that Don Norman, um, you know, the guy who wrote the design of everyday things, um, actually still uh, works there at the university and runs a design lab. And I was able to hang out there with him and other colleagues there for, for a couple times. Um, and uh, there I met somebody who, who did some work that I found very inspiring and, and impressive um, in terms of how much work went into actually finding information. Uh, so I wanted to share that. And it's also a, a paper that got published, of course, um, called um, Vlogging in Dentist Training. Uh, vlogging was back then the, the word, uh, this is from 2007, the publication, um, for video blogging, so short instructional video segments, you know, two to five minutes maybe, uh, that were being used to train or that, that, that were supposed to be used in dentist training. Um, so the student who did this, the PhD student there was Amaya Bekbar, 
Um, and uh, Jim Holland was the uh, professor supervising that work. Um, excellent researcher. And <coughs> they published this at the ACM group conference in 2007. Um, but the uh, data collection actually goes back three years from that. Uh, they collected their data um, at a dental hygiene training program in San Diego. Um, so this was people who were being trained um, to work, you know, in a dentist's practice, cleaning teeth, very simply, uh, put very simply. And the goal was um, two things. First of all, the ultimate goal, I should maybe say, is to introduce um, these, these video blogs, these, this video instruction into the training practice of these um, you know, dental uh, hygiene students. But in order to do that, they decided to really go deep and understand exactly how the teaching and learning works there today. Understand what kind of media they're using today for their training and what kind of you know, representations of knowledge are, are existing. And only after having collected that information, they decided to then go in to implement um, a prototype, a design prototype that would use this video logging um, technique uh, to provide additional material to the, um, to the students and the instructor um, to use in, you know, in the training, and then evaluate that with a second um, round of uh, an ethnographic study. So th this is kind of the approach that you would wish every company that ever releases interactive software anywhere to, his, to the workplace would use, right? Uh, you would wish that um, uh, RWTH Online had first, you know, in detail studied how we work at RWTH as students and PhD students and, and professors and administrative staff, and then carefully introduced their software. It didn't quite work that way here, uh, but in a way, this is also a great example of how you would introduce software if you really took your time to understand the problem space that you are putting your software into. So the method was an ethnographic study of the practice as it currently happens without the video pro uh, logging prototype. Um, you know, a little screens that would show short videos were not there yet. Then they implemented that. And then they did another study to observe how the design practice, how the teaching practice would change. Um, and the first method of understanding the current practice before even talking about any kind of um, technological change, right? Any, any kind of prototype thrown into it, um, any kind of um, uh, change of what's happening currently was actually going for one year into the field and capturing the practice of these people by observation. So um, Maya, the student went to these um, dental um, hygiene trainings and watched the trainer and the students do their thing, recorded videos, uh, did interviews right there and then, so contextual interviews, meaning in the context of, of the user's work environment. Um, and she did this with um, four instructors um, and overall 18 students. This is a whole year in the field. So this was part of her PhD thesis, right? Um, and what kind of things do you find there? Now, I don't want you guys to become experts in dental hygiene. That's not the point. I just want to give you an idea for the kinds of findings that, uh, that you would you know, pull out of these, these observations. Um, and some of the findings were things like the strategies that the instructors were using. Um, and uh, Amaya gave names to these. So this is what we said with coding the data, right? You look at your recordings, you, you do your observations, you make your field notes, and then you start to try to identify patterns. And one pattern that she saw was that there were different techniques that the instructors were using to explain things to students. Uh, one they called, uh, Amaya called molding. Uh, because, you know, here's the student's hand um, on, let's say, uh, you know, um, um, a, a patient's um, chin, you know, to hold the chin while he's guiding some hand tool. And then the instructor would put their hand over the student and guide the student's hand. That's why she called it molding. It's kind of like the instructor molding the grip of the, the, the student as the student is using some kind of device, for example. Directing, of course, verbally just tell, telling a student um, what to do. Um, that's probably one that you would expect. The molding maybe we wouldn't have thought about, right? Um, and of course, demonstration, using hand gestures to show how 
uh, people are supposed to handle an instrument correctly or incorrectly. I don't grab it like this, but grab it like that. Uh, these kinds of things. And this is just one example, right? Lots of findings that Amaya documented and um, shared in, in her thesis and in the paper in order to explain what she learned about um, this dental training. And then they decided, okay, how can we support, not replace uh, this instruction, this kind of instruction, and you know, then pick the, uh, the video logging as, a, as an example of you know, capturing these short uh, little bits. Um, and then went in basically developed a prototype and tested that again by observing over months how that how practice changed with that prototype. Okay, so that's an example of ethnography um, as HCI research method and you will come across these papers for sure uh, when you do your um, you know background research um, related work search for your own thesis or or seminars, etc. The third one <coughs> is uh, then um, making, you know, um, engineering and uh, design as, as a final sort of part of uh, the approaches that we look at in HCI research. So engineering and design, ah, everybody's like relaxing, right? That sounds more like close to my home base. This is stuff I know. Um, Cause you know, that's the kind of training that we, all of us here, um, have mostly received. And um, it's another very common and, and valuable way to, to conduct research. The objective in, in this case is often to, to solve some kind of problem that has been identified with a solution uh, that works. And it's a very typical um, approach by people who come from the engineering background, come from a design background, um, James Landay, um, whose materials I'm here shamefully, shamelessly uh, uh, reusing, um, is an excellent researcher um, at, uh, used to be at Berkeley, is now at Stanford, um, and has um, written a great, like James and Friends Systems How To, How To Do Systems Research. This is another name for that, uh, that kind of research. Um, the key attributes of this kind of, uh, of, of research is usually, um, First of all, you must have you know, the target, the, what you want to solve, the problem, has to be a concrete and compelling one uh, that has a demonstrated need. So if you tell people, I can significantly improve the accuracy of um, you know, typing on smartphones uh, with a completely new input technique, then everybody's ears will prick up, right? Because that's obviously um, a, uh, you know, something that could be really helpful to people. The second thing that is, uh, should be compelling about it is that, um, you know, it, you could also try to show that you can solve a whole set of problems with a new unifying set of principles. Um, one example might be, you know, um, we will see some examples later, but, uh, you know, the, uh, the springlets, the, the shape memory alloy based actuators that we built here at the lab um, showed that we could build a whole variety of different physical actuators would create haptic input on the skin of different kinds, all with one very simple mechanical setup. So that's, you know, kind of a unification um, argument. The third kind of compelling target is if, if you are able to explore how people will interact with computers in the future. If you say, you know, back in 2005, um, um, you know, we saw the first, you know, sort of affordable prototypes of multi-touch tables. And a whole bunch of research uh, sprang up, a whole conference was created around tabletop interaction um, because of that work. So it allowed a lot of people to explore this. You know, these tables weren't ready for, for mass production yet. Nobody had the techniques, the technology to make them really convenient to use for a bunch of people. That took another easily 10, 15 years. Um, but you know, the it was it was the tantalizing vision of this could be the re one interaction in the future that becomes really prevalent. So let's study how we can make the best use of it. And that's what people did with all these, um, you know, multi-touch tables in the in the two thousands that would only work in a dark room because they used infrared lighting and infrared sensors and they were kind of iffy and, and not really very reliable. But they they gave you an idea. We we did more than our own share of that kind of work. 
And then of course, 10 years later, you've got things like the Microsoft Surface Hub uh, that we have in our lab now, which is a capacitive touch table uh, that is very reliable in, in, in touch detection. Um, and you've kind of gotten rid of a lot of these problems that, that we used to have. So this is, you know, these are some reasons why, um, you know, you should have or some versions of compelling targets. The second key attribute of this work is a, um, it should be some kind of technical challenge. So it should require a novel, non-trivial algorithms or configurations of components um, that, that aren't easy to do. Right? And then of course, this is almost a, a, a staple review question when people send in these papers to conferences. Um, has this actually been built and does it work? Or is it just, you know, a cool idea in some student's head that could work if somebody sat down and, work, and built it? It's okay to just propose a, a new idea, but of course it's much stronger if you can actually show a working prototype. And this working prototype, um, when it gets deployed and tested with users, um, and the benefits that you were hoping to see are actually visible in your, in your user observations, uh, but maybe you also get some unexpected outcomes. You know, we've had that oftentimes, we design some kind of new interface for, let's say, you know, debugging code, a better way to navigate source code. And all of a sudden we see something that we hadn't expected. Um, people change their behavior, they become more effective, but in ways that we hadn't expected. Um, you know, those kind of things are, of course, also really interesting to see. Let's look at some examples of um, engineering and design uh, HCI research. Uh, the first one I want to share uh, is called SkinPut. Um, this was a best paper at CHI 2010, so this is 10 years ago, um, by Chris Harrison, uh, who um, at the time was working with uh, other PhD students at uh, Carnegie Mellon University and um, developed a technology that uh, appropriates, as he put it, the human body for acoustic transmission, which allowed the skin to be used as a finger input surface. So um, this work, of course, had the first hallmark of a, of a successful paper, which is a really clever name, SkinPut. Um, but it also had a really compelling idea, right? It took uh, basically acoustic waves traveling down your skin as you tap on your skin uh, and detect these somewhere off with a sensor uh, and by measuring the wave um, as, it, uh, trans you know, as it wanders uh, across your, the surface of your skin, um, where you tapped or what kind of action you did. We're gonna watch a short video here and uh, I'm gonna shut up because the video has Chris uh, explaining that technique uh, himself. And this is, by the way, one of those uh, typical videos that you would find accompanying many um, technical HCI papers like at CHI or, or WIST at the conference um, to get a quick glimpse of the technique. And especially for artifact contributions like this, technical contributions videos are super useful because you can see the interaction in real life you know, happening in a video rather than just seeing still images in a paper. So let's look at that short video. In this video, we present SkinPut, a bioacoustic sensing technique that allows the body to be appropriated as an input surface. When a finger taps the skin, the impact creates an ensemble of useful acoustic signals. When slowed down 14 times, we can see transverse waves on the skin's surface. However, complex longitudinal waveforms also propagate through the body. To capture these signals, we developed a special purpose bioacoustic sensing array. Variations in bone density, size and mass, as well as filtering effects from soft tissues and joints mean different locations are acoustically distinct. Software we developed listens for impacts and classifies them. Different interactive capabilities can be bound to different locations. Here we see a user playing a game of Tetris using their fingers as a control pad. Okay, so the video goes on a little more, um, but you get the idea, right? Um, so what I want to point out is what I just said about the key in ingredients here. Um, it's addressing an interesting problem, you know, imagining that if I'm on the go, wearable computing, you know, not wanting to wear, have a smartphone in my hand or something, um, I could imagine you're just really using my skin as uh, to tap out some, some commands. 
Um, so that is a, is a compelling use case um, because we're always looking for better input techniques on the go in mobile devices or in mobile settings. Um, and it used a non-trivial um, software and hardware setup of sensing these waves, these acoustic waves, and then uh, writing some kind of classifier that would um, tell you what kind of uh, signal was, was being detected and, and to classify these into different uh, kind of things. And they were able to show a functioning prototype um, that could you know, actually show that they were able to detect you know, thumb versus wrist versus palm tapping um, in their system. So it had all the um, key ingredients of, a, of an excellent um, uh, design slash engineering um, or systems research contribution. Given that you all have a computer science background, a technical background, it's likely that you will be doing some kind of work uh, in your thesis or, or later on maybe in your uh, PhD thesis if you decide to do that or in your industrial work um, that will have to do something with this engineering and design uh, kind of research contribution. So it's good to know it's called systems research many times uh, refer to that. And uh, it's good to know that that's out there and you can look at um, papers giving you suggestions like James Landay's descriptions um, on how to do that work well. Now, um, you can find out more about this, um, uh, like I said, from James Landy's uh, slides, um, James and Friends uh, Systems How To, uh, but also the, um, the research methods in HCI uh, book that I talked about by, uh, by Lazar um, um, has excellent information about mostly the test and look methods. So test and look, uh, take a look at Lazar um, for make, take a look at James Landy's work. Um, and maybe um, Anke, you can provide the, uh, the link to James Landy's stuff um, in the in the notes for in the Moodle. Okay, so uh, we've seen a uh, wonderfully divided world of three different kinds of research. Um, the messy truth is that this clear cut doesn't always exist. And many times you have to actually combine these methods. Um, to move forward in your research. Let me give you an example here. Um, maybe we'll use some work that we did ourselves um, called Bend Desk. Now from DIS1, you might all remember the um, discussion of uh, the um, Sun Starfire interactive workspace, right? This curved desk that people were touching, pointing at and, and looking at and interacting with. And we ended up building a system like that. And um, if, if you take that as an example, uh, there were initial observations that we made, right? We had maybe seen this, um, seen this work uh, from, you know, Starfire from the 90s. Uh, we'd also found that, you know, in related work in 2005, it became possible to actually build these multi-touch surfaces, but nobody was building them in curved shape. Everybody was building just flat tables. So we decided to make a prototype, right? Um, and this was when uh, Zimon, who's now a postdoc at my lab, was still, you know, a master's student. So before he even started his PhD at our lab. Um, so we built a prototype, um, you know, tested it out, uh, built, improved it, and then at some point uh, ran some real world studies with it. So we, you know, tried out this thing um, and did some observational, you know, um, uh, analysis, ethnographic like work. Uh, then we also spun, spun out into trying to build descriptive models. For example, one thing that we realized is when people interact with a curved surface is that they actually make mistakes when they have to uh, aim at things on the screen because this curved surface is something that we have trouble imagining a straight line on a curved uh, surface, for example. Um, so we, we started building error models of, of how, what kind of mistakes these people make on, in interacting with them. Um, and then we built some more uh, uh, prototypes with this. And, um, you know, then maybe in the end, uh, one of the things we, we tried was using the, um, the bent desk for long-term work. So having people really, you know, do real world tasks at them um, and improve our uh, descriptive model that described our errors into a predictive model that could actually predict the errors that people would make. So, this is often what happens, right? As you move through your research career, if you want, uh, you're going to pick and choose the methods uh, that take you forward for the, to the next step. Right? It may be that you have to do a study. It may have be that you need to 
um, write a, th a, a you know, construct a theory or that you need to build um, a prototype. Um, you know this example. Um, uh, I think you wrote a benefit and uh, a contribution and benefit statement for this command maps, right? Um, and this is a uh, is a good example um, of of work that actually was able to estimate performance using a, a theory before actually running a study that then showed that the predicted model is actually correct, right? Just to show you a good example of, of how this could work, right? So um, this was an example that we took from the CHI 2012 um, proceedings. I think we'll take um, a very short break now, um, and then we will uh, dive into how to write uh, protocols for experimental research. So. Um, five minutes to get some fresh air, get yourself a drink, stay hydrated, uh, stretch your legs, and uh, I'll see you back at 11.14. All right, let's continue. So um, we're now going to talk a little bit more about um, how to actually do experimental research and how to uh, structure it. When you, when you do experimental research, what you need is you need um, almost like a cookbook recipe uh, that tells yourself what you're going to be doing and also that tells everybody else what you did. Um, why do you think this is important that you describe exactly how you, um, how you conducted your experiment? Any thoughts? You can just raise your hand if you want, your, your little blue hand. Yeah, Christoph, go ahead. Uh, if I recall co correctly, we said the good research is the research that any person can uh, repeat and get the same or similar results. Mm -hmm. So if you if we want to get similar results, the, the other person should do exactly what we did. Yeah, exactly. So replicability is what people uh, refer to uh, in, in academia for this. Um, if I describe my experiment well enough, then somebody, if they repeated everything as instructed in my documentation, in my protocol, they should get the same results. And if they don't, then either I didn't describe something well enough, or maybe my measurements were off and I, I forgot about some variable that, that they chose differently. Um, so good research in this space is, is replicable, right? This is a big, uh, big thing. Um, you know, in, in, in many fields like, um, uh, for example, uh, biology, um, it's perfectly normal that people replicate experiments several times just to be 100% sure that this is actually what's going on and to, you know, a replication of a result is something that strengthens the original um, the uh, theory. We don't do much of that in HCI, but uh, we should be doing more. Okay, so let's look at um, how you operationalize this. You might start out with a research question and, and we're gonna throw a couple of examples here uh, in so that you get an idea of what we are uh, talking about. Uh, we're not gonna follow any of these um, questions or, or approaches in, in detail. But you know, we might have a research question that says young uh, participants in a study might have a significantly better memory than, than older participants. So uh, let's see here, you're, you're up. Um, give me an idea on how you could actually study this. How would you turn that research question um, into, you know, proper, uh, into a proper hypothesis? What kind of uh, variables would you use? How would you operate, operationalize this? Again, you just raise your uh, blue hand and take a shot. There's no single right answer. Yeah, move us here. Go ahead. Um, maybe we can conduct uh, an experiment where we ask uh, users to uh, read a text from a screen, and after some time, we ask them to recall it from their memory and uh, type uh, it, and then we compare the compare both the texts, and then um, we um, conclude the results. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so having them read a text uh, on screen and then ask, wait a while uh, and then ask them to repeat it back or type it back in. 
uh, that's a good uh, that's a good way of doing it. But we already see the moment you sit down and really think about it. Hmm, how am I going to actually measure um, precision here? Like if somebody if the word if the text contained the word apple and people type apples, is that correct or wrong or is it somewhere in between? Is it as bad as completely forgetting about that part? Um, so that's one thing that we would have to understand better. Um, how exactly are we going to measure what you know, correct recall is and what incorrect recall is? And the other thing is, uh, we haven't talked about age here yet, right? We just said young people and, and older people. So you'll have to give you know, some kind of age group, for example, to compare these. So here's an example of how you could do this. Uh, you could say your hypothesis is participants aged between 16 and 30 years will recall significantly more nouns from a list of 20 nouns uh, than participants aged between 55 and 70. So you see the subtle difference here, right? The, the thing before, if I said, okay, go, this is your thesis to topic, do the study, you would have been like, hmm, what am I gonna do? Now, you know what kind of people you need to recruit. You've got an age group that was being provided to you. Um, and you know that you need lists of 20 nouns uh, and you know that you're going to ask them to you know, read them. I haven't talked about yet you know, how long the pause should be or if there's some kind of distraction in between to make it harder to remember, kind of like what we did with you guys in DIS-1, right, when we tested your short-term memory. Um, but you see, this is moving towards something that I could imagine building a study around. Um, and if somebody else built a study around it, they should get similar results. Whereas if I don't specify what old and young means, then it's you know, very much open to interpretation. So um, what are the basic parts of an, of an experimental study? Uh, what you're basically doing is uh, you've got a whole bunch of different variables, right? Um, so you might, you have uh, variables that you want to control. Uh, they are the independent variables that you, um, you know, that you manipulate in a controlled way. So um, A versus B, for example, uh, these could be this, these could be the um, independent variables that you want to uh, twiddle, right? You've got a whole bunch of other things that you control and hold constant, right? So uh, you try to, for example, not change, I don't know, the temperature in the room during the study or, um, you know, the, the, the kind of uh, device people are using. Um, if you can't hold a constant, then you can sometimes uh, do you know, a random assignment if you can't hold down the variable completely um, to, to balance out the effects of it. Um, but in, that, in any way, you're trying to keep these things out of influencing what you, what you measure, right? So you've got your variables A and B, and you've got a whole bunch of other things. These are the gray boxes that you want to measure. Um, and then you compare. Uh, what the effects under A and under B were. So there are two kinds of, there are confounding variables that are things that you are not able to hold down constantly um, and that basically mess with your results. Right? So for example, if, if it happens that you run one study with one condition uh, in the morning when it's nice and cool in the room and the other one at you know, 3 p.m. when it's all hot and stuffy in the room, you might get an effect of that and you didn't think of controlling this, holding it down, um, balancing it out. Um, and so it will confound your results. The scales of your um, independent variables um, and also the dependent ones can be of a whole bunch of different uh, kinds. So you've got nominal scales, categorical scales, interval scales, ratio scales, um, Categorical, for example, if you say um, have two different input devices, right? There's not like one is more than the other, or uh, there's no continuous um, um, mathematical uh, value that you can assign to them. They are just different conditions. There are a whole bunch of different um, elements that go into these experimental studies uh, based on that graphic that I just showed you. Um, what you're doing is you are in, in the sense of mani manipulating is that you change the value of the independent value variable or independent variables uh, to create uh, what's called treatment conditions. Um, so 
although we hope that the dependent variable will ultimately change, we do not manipulate it, right? This is um, something we don't, we don't touch. We hope that it changes as a result of our change of the independent variables, because in our kind of experimental study, we are actually looking um, for a causal uh, effect um, relationship. The, um, let me just check here real quick. Um, am I creating the, these little blips and I'm just gonna quit this. Slack was running in the background and creating lots of noise here. All right. Um, so what you measure are values of dependent variables in each treatment condition. So you will often re read about uh, the number of treatment or, or different conditions. And this is what people are referring to, basically the different values given to the independent variables um, in combination if there's more than one. And then you compare uh, one treatment condition to another one. If there are consistent differences between these treatments, then you have an evidence of causality. Right? Every time you change uh, one independent variable in a certain direction, the dependent variable so-and-so changes accordingly. All the other variables you try to control. So you hold them down so that they don't influence the two variables that you're examining. You have at least two variables that you're looking at, right? You'll at least have one independent variable that you're tweaking. Um, and you've got at least one dependent variable that you're measuring, but you could have more independent variables that you need to uh, change in combination. Um, and you may have several dependent variables that you're measuring. So let's look at how we can get a, get a grip on this, on this uh, whole setup uh, by writing what's called a, a user study protocol. Uh, the user study protocol is basically the reasoning uh, behind a research project and, and it gives it the structure that you need. Uh, this is taken from O'Brien and Wright um, from 2002, how to write a protocol, if you want to uh, look at this in more detail. Um, so a user study protocol is basically a document that just explains to you uh, why you conducted a research project in what way and how did you conduct your, your study. So on the one hand, you want to make sure that the research question and hypotheses are stated clearly. Uh, this greatly helps um, to uh, let the reader know what you're out for, right? What are you hunting for? What is the thing you're trying to, to show? Um, and it documents the research process procedure in detail um, in order to, as Christoph was saying, um, enable replication later on. And also to provide a guide for everybody involved in the study on what to actually do. Because oftentimes it's not just you doing this, right? You, you're with a team, with colleagues, um, doing the study together. You may have to rely on each other, each other to conduct um, the experiment in the same way, even though one day it's one person, the next day it's the other one. And that's also what the user study protocol helps you do. And finally, um, the protocol helps you to monitor whether your research is progressing and how it is progressing. And this user study protocol consists of um, a whole different bunch of parts. Uh, first one, and this is not so unlikely what, uh, unlike what you read in a, in a research paper on the topic. That's why I think it's an, a useful um, skeleton to, to understand. The first section of, of context and aim basically gives you the research context. What's the status quo? Uh, what are current problems and disadvantages to how things are working right now? Uh, and what is your particular plan to improve that status quo? Um, so an example might be, you know, touch input um, of uh, smartphones often happens in one hand, but the problem with this is that you reach, you have trouble reaching the areas at the top of your screen when you hold it in only one hand and you can't use your other hand because you're carrying a bag of grocery shopping, right? Um, and the improvement might be that you say, I have an improvement in form of an artifact. I have a suggestion on how to, uh, allow people to touch the top part of the smartphone with one hand uh, with a new interaction technique. Um, and you can derive maybe some design recommendations from that that could be the, the outcome of that. Then your research context uh, would basically um, allow uh, people to understand what's the most relevant literature, what's the contribution that each paper has and what are the deficiencies. Um, this is a part where you can tell if somebody does a good job in that part of their, their documentation, which you often also find in the, in the paper that's published, then even just the, the related work section that gives you the research context is often super helpful for the reader. 
because it's a little review article, kind of like what you're writing when you do a seminar with us, of, of like 10 different research papers or 20 different research papers summarizing what each of these papers did and what their contribution was. Um, so then you sort of out from this research context, you describe the purpose of your current study um, and how it plans to, to tackle the problems that you mentioned in your, in your context. Um, so ideally, once I've read your research context, you've told me what other people have done in this field. Um, for example, you've uh, shown me the you know, five different other papers that have looked at how to reach the top of your smartphone, but none of these techniques works well for, uh, you know, when walking, for example, then you can say, and when walking, I want to design a technique that, that works better in that context. So this is why I'm doing this. Next up, you explain your variables, right? So you provide a list of your, the variables, um, the independent and dependent ones, um, giving a short description of what they are and what their levels and scales are. Um, here's an example. Right? Independent variables could be, uh, for example, the device size. Device size, however, you need to explain what that is. Uh, what I mean by this, for example, in the case of a smartphone, could be the, the size of the input surface, right? Um, and you could say there are two levels of that independent variable. Levels basically means different you know, conditions or different treatments that you will use in your, in your study. Um, and you could define two levels, maybe small and large. Small um, basically looking like um, you know, an iPod size or an iPhone size, um, and large being um, a, uh, an iPad size, for example. Dependent variables in this case could be if we wanted to show that we found a way to improve users reach to touch the top of the smartphone uh, in one handed use. So I'm, what I'm talking about is this like, you know, you're holding your phone in one hand and you want to reach something up there and you can't quite get there. Right. That's what we're talking about. Um, the dependent variable would be the targeting arrow, for example. Um, if I ask the user to click on something at the top of the screen and they click it and it can measure how far their click is away from where they were supposed to click, then I have a, a distance in millimeters um, for, for the actual um, you know, mistake that the user made. So I've got my variables, very simple in this case. Um, and then I have some hypotheses, right? So the hypotheses should clearly describe what your relationship of independent and dependent variables are. Um, you can often also group your independent variables uh, but you got to make sure that it's clear what variables you're talking about. Um, so uh, don't say things like, you know, uh, the performance of, of A is just uh, better, but clearly state um, what variables you expect to change in which way. Um, and also in the, in the um, statement, you explain clearly what you expect to happen. So not just there will be a difference, but um, hopefully you can um, expect that one thing will be faster or more accurate, for example, than the other. So your hypothesis is usually um, the <coughs> supposed relation between the variables that you will, uh, that you will study. So for example, uh, some conditions that you might have uh, uh, will decrease the success rate and increase the number of failed attempts of targeting errors. Oh, this should read bigger, not blender, sorry. Um, it's a typo. So the larger the device, basically, the harder it gets to hit things at the top of the device correctly, right? This could be your claim. Now notice that so far I've only talked about um, how to run a study that would test this with the independent variable of device size. I haven't talked about that I compared two different techniques to reach the top of the screen yet. Right? That could be another independent variable if I wanted to test a particular uh, input technique. In the task section then, uh, you include all the information that you need uh, to give to the participants so they can do the task. Um, what are the things that the, the, uh, the participant needs to do? For example, you could, uh, this, these are the instructions you would give to participants, right? Um, tap on the input device to hit a target on the screen, for example, um, like, like this. Um, and uh, it should also document in the task section what happens if people make a mistake. Um, so for example, 
if somebody tries to hit a target but they 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 miss it, uh, then the target could could turn red, and the participant would get four more trials to hit the target, and then if he doesn't hit it after four trials, it would get booked as you know didn't hit it at all. The task section would also explain when you collect data points. So, for example, um, you define what you say is an error. Right? An error is measured when the first attempt was not successful, like how far off was the user from the target. Or you could measure, you know, the distance to um, a, a pin, uh, like, a, like a crosshair target, no matter whether the user hit very close to it or, or far away from it, you can always measure the distance in, in millimeters from the target center. So there are different ways to do that. And one thing that often catches us is that we need to tell our users whether they should speed up or be as precise as possible. And you get very different behavior um, based on what you tell your users. So this is one thing that needs to be controlled carefully so that all the users go in with the same expectation for all the conditions. For example, you can tell them, um, you know, try to tap these things as fast as possible while staying in the general space. Kind of like what I did, remember, in DIS1 when we did the Fitz Law tapping task, right? When you went between these two slots, I told you, go as fast as you can while staying inside the slots, right? I didn't ask you to focus exactly on the center of each area. Next up comes the experiment procedure. This, so this includes all the information about what happens in the study um, as a full step-by-step -step list, so as detailed as possible so that somebody else can really replicate this. Um, typically, it includes a section where you introduce the participant to the purpose of your study, right? This explains what happens when the participant walks into the room, sits down with you in order to start the experiment. Uh, what do you explain to them? Uh, uh, what do you tell them? How do you ex uh, tell them what they need to do? Uh, not just the task, but you know, also if there is like a, uh, whether there will be an interview afterwards or whether things are being recorded, etc. Telling this, uh, this, this, this uh, part of the experiment procedure also documents whether you tell people um, whether they have to fill out questionnaires, whether they can take breaks, etc. Whether there are any compensations. Um, you know, did you give everybody a, a 10 euro Amazon gift certificate for their troubles or, or did they do it just out of the goodness of their heart? Um, were there any uh, costs or risks associated with the experiment? We typically don't have these kinds of risks because we typically don't do things that could be harmful to people, but um, you may end up having to document that if there is anything like that. Next up, you typically have to tell who were your participants. Um, and you can probably guess that the best studied group of people in the world are psychology undergraduate students. Because every psychology lab that runs this user study grabs their undergraduate students from their classes and uses them to run the study. Right? So they are, we know everything we could possibly want to know about psychology undergraduate students in the world. Um, this is a sort of a, um, a little bit awkward, but oftentimes, uh, participants are pulled from, you know, the, the experimenters' social surroundings, right? Because it's easier to convince somebody that you know to help you in your study. Um, whether you do that or not, um, you need to say who you picked, right? So who was your target group uh, in age uh, ranges, uh, left-handed, right-handed, uh, male, female, other, um, all these things need to be um, documented in your, in your participant section. This is also the place where you note the required number of participants. Uh, this will often depend on your independent variables. Uh, so, for example, if you um, <coughs> have to test a, uh, an independent variable with, let's say, three different levels, um, that means that you will... Uh, so the example could be you have got a test with a small device, a medium device, and a large device, right? Uh, so in order to balance out learning effects between conditions, you could then, if you're using a uh, within group study where everybody does every condition, um, you could you know, have some people start with the first device, some people start with the second device, some people start with the third device. Um, you would then basically create a, what's called a Latin square um, so that each order of these um, conditions happens at some point so that you balance out the learning effects. But that also means that you need three times the number of participants that you would use 
um, if you didn't have these three different levels. Your experimental design then goes into more detail about the within, uh, within groups or between groups or within or between subjects design. These are two different uh, terms of the same concept. And how do you care about order effects? I just mentioned things like the uh, Latin square um, to, to uh, make sure to have some sort of counterbalancing. Um, you can also randomize the order of con uh, conditions if um, you want to, or you can have an intentional order um, because you have an explanation why you think that there is no learning effect from A to B, but there's very much a learning effect from B to A. What you will often find if you look at papers at Kai or WIST uh, that have that kind of study is a list that looks somewhat like this. <clears throat> um, it will tell you that, uh, for example, they had 12 participants uh, that took part in the study um, multiplied with each participant being exposed to three different input conditions, um, multiplied with each user also doing this with two device sizes, and then maybe three blocks, which means um, a block is, could be a repetition of the same experiment. In each block, you would have three different target sizes that were displayed, and um, for each target size, you used nine different positions. And then you repeated that three times. So um, this would give you a total of you know, close to 18,000 trials that you have as data points. So this kind of breakdown uh, you often see in the paper explaining to you how the user, uh, how the author got to the number of data points that they collected. Um, the apparatus that you then set up basically describes your software and hardware. Um, apparatus sounds very uh, formal, but it basically means it's your prototype, your study setup, your technical study setup. What kind of computer did you use? You'd be surprised how many studies we read where they say that, um, you know, oh, and uh, the reaction time was this and this, um, but, you know, it's a study from the, I don't know, early 80s and the computers were so slow that actually they added a significant amount in their processing time to the reaction times. And now we don't know because we don't know what kind of technology they use. So always write down what kind of computer you used if, you, if it's involved in your study. What kind of user interface toolkit did you use if you built a UI? You know, what kind of um, uh, widget set or, or UI toolkit? Um, did you use network communication? If you did, you know, what kind of connection did you use so that people understand things about latency, for example, or reliability of communication? How was the hardware placed in front of the user? On a table? Were they holding it in their hand? Which hand? Were they able to put, the, put it down between trials? Did they have to hold their hand um, um, out in the air or for the whole time? All these kinds of things. Anything people need to do know, in our case, usually about the software and hardware that they were interacting with. And again, this is supposed to help replication. So um, if you're a good person, then you make sure that your apparatus is documented so well that others can replicate it. And if you're an even better person, you might actually put your prototype code online and publish it as part of your paper so that people can actually rerun the experiment using your code. Right? Uh, that's often a very welcome way. Uh, it's uh, very well received by reviewers if they see that you, they could actually replicate the experiment because you actually put your code online on you know, GitHub or something. All right, so, um, and once we have all this, uh, then we get to the results section, right? So you've run, the, the experiment has been run. So what, what's in your protocol next is the results section that uh, describes how you plan to analyze the data. Um, then you get to all the references that you used in, uh, in the protocol. So other papers that you uh, refer to in your, in your context section. Uh, and that sort of completes your protocol. So your protocol is kind of like a little paper in itself describing the experimental setup that you used. Now in the end, if you have this application, uh, if, if you have this protocol, what you can do with this is, is you can quickly set up the study environment using the, the apparatus section. I can find out what hardware I need, what software I need and install it all. I can explain to the participant what they need to do using the procedure section in the protocol. Um, which also means that you, as a if you are conducting the experiment as the experimenter, you actually have a checklist that you can go through, right? Because you've got your protocol, making sure that you don't forget anything to say to the participant. Imagine you run your experiment and you forget in like, you know, two of 10 users, you forget to tell them to go as fast as possible. You can basically throw away those two user uh, data points uh, that you collected for them because they started under different assumptions. So this checklist is super useful. 
Um, you can explain to participants what they need to do uh, using the task and variables section so you can tell them what's going on. Now, sometimes we don't tell users openly what we're measuring because we don't want them to be biased. Um, but that will also be documented in the study protocol. What kind of things were users told ahead of time and what kind of things did we tell them after the fact. It's okay not to tell users everything if you need to uh, you know, um, avoid a certain bias. Usually you share um, what you held back um, with them then after the experiment. And then uh, you can also, uh, with the protocol, quickly start your first statistical analysis using the results section that says what kind of results um, you were going to collect and how you're planning to analyze the data. Uh, you wouldn't believe how many people start out, do an experiment, collect data, and then sit down and say, hmm, what am I going to do with all of this? And that's a very bad position to be in. Uh, Anke is smiling. Yeah, we've never done this, right? Have we? <laughs> um, uh, but, you know, sometimes it's really helpful to understand ahead of time, what am I going to do with that data once I have it? Uh, what is the kind of statistical analysis I'm planning to run? Because that will tell you what kind of data you need to collect. And finally, the protocol you can also give to other researchers to repeat the study, as I said before. So I know this is, you know, oh, this is, uh, you know, tedious. Let's look at an example, maybe, to give you a better, better idea. Um, so we're going to take a look at a sample user study protocol here um, to give you an idea of what these things look like. So uh, the, the title of the protocol could be evaluating the performance of a new keyword layout. Right? Um, so this grabs uh, you know, your attention, it goes straight to the point, but it doesn't state uh, anything you know, obvious. Then uh, we could say the research problem that we're tackling. Um, this is actually tricky. Um, but we could say the research problem is we intend to find out if our new keyboard layout performs faster and with, uh, with fewer errors than the, the QWERTY keyboard. The new layout would lead to smaller form factors, right? So these were two things that we were hoping to, to get out of this. Um, this is typically written in the, in the active voice um, uh, and not, 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 not in passive voice. So what will you study and, and what are the results uh, going to mean? Right? What's your motivation for doing that study? Next up then in the, in the study protocol, uh, you would have the context section. So for example, you could say there have been many new layouts that appear to perform faster than QWERTY, but that lead to fatigue. And then we cite a couple of papers of, of these other works. Right? Um, and typically would you know, be a little more than that one single sentence in your, in your um, context section. We then get to the aim that's derived from the, uh, the context here, uh, what we're trying to do, and then basically have some hypotheses. For example, um, the null hypothesis would be, you know, the, the inverse of the one that we try to show, uh, there will be no difference in typing speed between the new layout and, and the core date layout. And if we remember to uh, refute that null hypothesis, remember this from GIS1, we talked about this, um, then we have a way to say with our data, um, in, in, in classic um, statistical analysis, we then have a 95% confidence uh, that there is a connection between these two variables because only the remaining 5% uh, uh, is the likelihood that the, this correlation between the, uh, the typing speed change and the new layout is purely coincidental. That's what basically the p-value tells you when you run these kinds of studies. Okay, and then you get to sort of your, um, your research method, the independent variables, uh, independent variables, levels, operational uh, definition, measurement, and uh, scale and unit, um, and you get to your task. So for example, the user will do a composition task, meaning uh, typing text, using statements from McKenzie et al., Kai 2003. This is actually a, uh, an interesting technique. It means that for our uh, experiment, we use a text corpus that already exists. Uh, the paper that's referred to here by McKenzie is one that actually includes um, uh, a set of statements that these pe people used for their studies. Uh, and so we're going to use the same ones so that the results be, uh, will be comparable to what they did. Participants will do the following activities to complete the task, blah, 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 blah. Then you list how many participants you have, uh, what the characteristics are, age, demographics, etc. Uh, and any criteria that made you exclude or include certain participants. For example, you might say, um, I, I ran this study um, that was about the um, effects of red and green dots on the screen, and, but I had one participant that was colorblind, 
which we found in a pretest, and so we excluded that person from the study because we needed uh, people who were had normal color vision uh, for this experiment. Uh, and then comes the, your experimental design within groups, between groups, you know, how you assign the conditions, whether you did Latin square, whether you did all permutations of all orders, which is very tedious, needs a lot of people to run it and takes a long time, um, those kinds of things. Your experimental setup, you know, the apparatus. So what's the hardware? What are the special features in your testing space? Imagine if you've ever been to our lab, uh, you've seen the big project space there, right? Uh, and that project space has this, you know, giant multi-touch table sitting there um, uh, and you might mount you know cameras above it or something so you will talk about um, this kind of setup uh, explain anything that is that is out of the ordinary but also of course all the the hardware that you used as we said earlier you come to a procedure what the experimenter will do to set up the testing space so how did you prep the space for example um, the position of tangibles on this table was reset to the following positions before each new user came in or something like this. You share your data analysis methods, you know, what, what kind of um, uh, ways that you use to, to uh, analyze your data and you provide the references that we talked about. In a, in a protocol, in a user study protocol, it's usually really helpful to have some sketches uh, or images like photos of the test space um, or sketches of what the user was supposed to be doing um, as part of it. So, you know, an image uh, is better than a thousand words. This also applies to here. So if you take a picture of your, of your setup, that usually really helps people to understand what your uh, device, uh, your experimental setup looked like. That section you typically write in the, uh, in the future in the sense of, you know, um, the participant will do this and this. Okay, so now we get to all the various extraneous variables. Sorry, it's a spelling mistake here, extraneous, I'm missing an E. Um, we have some situational variables that we can hopefully, uh, you know, try to control. So this means things like lighting conditions, for example, in the space. Uh, we try to make sure that they are constant um, so that they don't impact our experiment. Uh, if we cannot do that, then we try to at least change them in the same ways for all the conditions we're testing. So if you need to run some things while it's dark and some things while it's daylight, then at least distribute these two effects across your two um, variable, uh, across your two conditions. So that not everybody using, you know, uh, one device uh, design that you're testing has to do it in, in, at night and the others are, are working during the day. Um, participants, you need to uh, make sure that, you know, the differences that are between people, that exist between people that are unavoidable, um, are also things that you can control. So learning effects, etc. cetera. Um, we've talked about counterbalancing, for example, by letting some people start with one uh, condition and others, the other half of your group starts with the other condition and then they swap after, the, after they're done with the first one. So that um, both conditions that you are testing um, where sometimes came first and sometimes came second, right? That helps you to reduce uh, learning effects. Um, experimental bias is tricky because, you know, here you are, you're a master student. You've built this awesome new gadget, right? That can do something really cool. Like, I don't know, type really fast or sketch in 3D really fast. And now you need to test it. So naturally you'll be walking up to your users and say, uh, okay, so you're going to test two systems here um, to create 3D sketches. One is, um, you know, I don't know, SolidWorks, uh, the boring commercial run-of-the-mill program, and the other one is my awesome new sketching tool that I just spent my last half year of my life building. And I want you to, you know, completely unbiased evaluate the two. And of course, everybody who, who hears that will sort of, you know, favor your tool because they know it's sort of the tool that you built and that you put your heart in, right? So be careful not to include experimental bias in your, um, in your study. And one way to do that is to have the procedure spelled out very clearly so that it's, you know, it makes sure that you don't say things that could bias the, uh, the users one way or, or the other. Um, what I want to do is, um, I think we still have this video in here. Um, 
uh, I want to really quickly look at you uh, at this video with you, watch that, and then see, uh, you know, especially take a look at this uh, user study uh, uh, section in this paper, uh, and then see if we can uh, get an idea of how this protocol was created and how it was also, um, you know, how you would how you would run the protocol and how the authors would do this. We're going to start with this and run the video now, and then we can, I think, maybe continue the rest of this in the in the lab, Anka, right? When, if we run out of time. Uh, what I want to understand with this is how the paper attempted to establish uh, internal validity and external validity. So um, making sure that inside, uh, you know, the internal, that there was no bias between different conditions, but also that it is ecologically valid, that it actually has some real world meanings. So here's the, uh, the video. Mid uh, manipulation adds an extra dimension to existing desktop input. However, the combination of mid -air and desktop input poses several challenges. First, how high to place the interaction layer. Second, how thick should the interaction layer be. Third, how to distinguish between air tapping and homing to the keyboard. To answer these questions, we present findings from two experiments. Okay, so this is the very short um, video that just gives you an idea of what these people were trying to do. So um, let's see here. What would you say if we go back to the, uh, the list of things that we had here? Um, what would be things that you would do as a user study for this? You want to study this mid-air interaction, this, this tapping movement, right? You want to look at how people... Um, you know, how, what is the best range of this thickness of the mid-air range where, you, where people can do air taps uh, and you want to determine how you can uh, reliably distinguish between uh, taps in the air and people moving back to the uh, to the uh, to the keyboard from this mid-air interaction. The whole idea here is of course to um, add an interaction to the space above your keyboard so you're typing on a keyboard and then you can move your hands up and do stuff over here make a movement and then go back down to your keyboard and continue typing. So that's what these people uh, uh, did in this particular paper. And um, I think, do we have... Um... Ah, uh, sorry, the, I think is the paper available, Anke, for, for looking at the user study section? Um, we can do that. It usually did without it, but I can load it, uh, upload it into Moodle for tomorrow then. Uh, yeah, so for tomorrow, I think you want to discuss that in more detail. For now, we're just going to take a first stab at trying to um, create a user study for this very short um, uh, sketched idea. So what would you set out to do um, as a, a protocol? So we can go through the different parts of the user study protocol. I think we have a, a list here. So what would be the research question that we're, that we're asking? Can somebody take a first stab at a research question? It's a little trickier because you just saw the short video that gave you really not much more than a hunch, right? What, what, this, uh, what these guys are trying to study. So we have a, the, the hunch that they were expressing was around the, uh, hmm, I think if people could interact above the keyboard in addition to just type on the keyboard, and if we could somehow detect that, you know, those movements in the air and then could let people go back down to the keyboard, that could be an interesting addition to the, the in, you know, to the interaction capabilities that you have while you're typing on the keyboard. That's a hunch, right? That's not a good research question yet. How would you run a, how would you uh, study that question if you had to go out and now, um, assuming you have these kinds of um, technical capabilities to detect these kinds of touches, you know, these kinds of mid-air gestures.
Uh, Lovis, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the general question would, would be something like which, which factors um, uh, play a role in how, how this can be used efficiently. And in the video, they already, like, they split it already in this more detailed questions like um, what, um, what size does the, uh, uh, like, in, at which height should it be and how thick should, should the layer be? So, um, mm -hmm. these are basically the, the research quest, uh, questions. And um, yeah, then you have to derive some, um, yeah, like different conditions, um, different uh, layer uh, heights and different uh, thicknesses. And, exactly. um, and mm -hmm. then try to um, maybe, yeah, then you have to show, um, yeah, let them do the same task, something um, um, with the different conditions, like different users try to do it and then um, you see if if they um, if the, what's what's the question if they um, if they perform faster um, or less if there are like errors um, um, when they tr is when they think they um, they are still in the layer and they um, but but it's not detected anymore. Um, yeah, so, so, just, so yeah. you're right. There's there's different ways you could look at this. Um, uh, you could say I'm going to actually try to determine whether the ultimate idea of being faster to do a task, let's say you get to give people a task like um, editing a piece of text, right? You know, changing things here and there and they type on their keyboard and then they have to either go to their mouse and make the changes there or they can use the space above the keyboard to do quick gestures. Um, you could compare that and do, go for a performance metric measurement, uh, a comparative evaluation uh, between your new sort of air typing uh, keyboard, like air gesture keyboard and the uh, and the traditional way of doing it. Uh, you could also, as you were saying, and as the authors are pointing out, go at it in a more explorative way and say, um, I just want to understand how I would even begin to design such an interaction um, before I try to compare it to the state of the art. And that's actually not a bad idea because if you just make a wild guess on how thick that layer should be, how, how high it should be above the, uh, the keyboard, and then you test it against um, you know, a standard interaction, and you find out that you know your new technique is slower than the existing one. You don't know whether it's because the technique in general is a bad idea, or you just picked the wrong thickness and distance from the keyboard. Right? So it's good to first explore the new technical idea for uh, as an as an interaction technique, and that's what this paper does. It looks at what are different thicknesses of these layers, what are different heights of these mid-air interaction layers above the keyboard, and how can we vary these. Uh, and determine which ones would be optimal uh, within that technique to, to use if we wanted to use it. And once you've done that, then you can go ahead and compare what you found and say, this was the best performing uh, you know, configuration that we found for our mid-air interaction. Now we're going to test how fast it is compared to some other kind of traditional keyboard plus mouse, for example. Okay, uh, so this gives you a bit of an idea of where you want to be with your protocol. We've got this checklist here um, that really uh, repeats most of the things that we've talked about already, just gives you a nice uh, summarized thing to go through to make sure that you've got your research question in there, uh, whether your question is, is clear or whether it has, it has alternative interpretations, um, whether if you prove the hypothesis that it actually contributes to understanding the question you were asking, whether you've defined the variables clearly, uh, whether there's, again, more than one possible interpretation for them, uh, whether the design is uh, chosen so that the trade-offs are there. There's often this trade-off between you have a very um, high internal validity of your study, meaning that you have tied down all the variables that could be controlled, everything is, you know, clinically clean and, 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 uh, and, and properly controlled. Um, for example, let's say you're designing a calendar tool and you're setting somebody down in an empty room. He just gets the calendar tool on their tablet and everything else is removed. They don't have their smartphone. They don't have their computer and they just test the calendar tool, right? That's very easy to control and make the same experience for everybody, but it's also not very realistic, right? So you're losing ecological validity or external validity 
because the actual use of your tool would be happening in a, an environment where people's smartphones ring or they get text messages, they open up mails on the computer, they check dates with a wall calendar that's hanging on the wall. So the more you make your, um, your, your experiment internally valid and, and sort of clinically clean, the less likely it actually represents real world usage. And that's a trade off you need to find. Then of course, a good protocol um, gives you um, the statistical methods that will be used. Um, you know, it should have all the resources that, that um, um, you need to conduct the experiment. It should list them clearly. Uh, you should understand whether you are going to bore the pants off your users. I mean, you can't expect a user to type, uh, to click at targets on a screen for three hours straight, right? So the time of the end user is also a very valuable commodity. So remove any um, test trials or conditions that don't really tell you something new. Uh, from your experiment to shorten down the time per user as much as um, you know is possible. Ultimately, I guess if you pick up a protocol, you should be able to look at it and have no idea about the experiment before. You should pick up the protocol and be able to set it up and conduct the experiment. That's perfect replicability. Um, few protocols get to that level of detail, but that's sort of the gold standard you're aiming for. All right, just to be complete here for today, um, there is um, a list of references that we uh, mentioned uh, in the class today that you guys can uh, take a look at um, at your own time if you want to learn more about the different studies, like, for example, the uh, GPS one that we saw last week or um, the, uh, the pinstripe textile interaction or the video logging from, from Amaya Beckhorn, James Holland, etc. Thanks very much um, for being here. I'm currently under the impression, and I'm saying this very carefully, that we will not have a class next week because there is a Fachschaftsvollversammlung, so the student body um, usually has uh, the next Tuesday morning reserved for uh, elections or, or for, for gatherings. Um, and so we're assuming that we won't be teaching. Uh, but Anke will uh, let you know via Moodle with a message uh, whether that is actually the case or whether due to the corona um, online teaching set up um, the, um, uh, that date next week is freed up by the student body so that we can have a class. I don't know that at this point. I'm assuming that we won't have one. So if you don't hear anything, stay away. But if we do contact you and tell you, oh, no, teaching is happening after all, um, please plan for that. Thanks, everybody, for hanging out. And I'll see you again, if not next week, then the week after that. Bye. This content was provided by RWTH, Aachen University.